Hi there, Old School fans. I'm Dan, Old School Condition Training Man. This is Dan's Old School Conditioning Training. And welcome back, guys. And if you're a new subscriber uh, or you're new to the page, I, I hope what you've seen on the page so far, I hope you enjoy this and I hope you enjoy lots of other great content that's coming soon and the fun that we have with it as well. Right, okay, so what are we talking about today? All right, cardiovascular endurance training, all right, steady state cardiovascular endurance training. There's lots of other types of cardiovascular, cardiovascular training, but these next few chats are really all about cardiovascular endurance training, um, its history, all right, in this chat, and, and then we're gonna be going on to what you can get out of it, you know, and how it can help you if you've not done it before, how you can get into it, um, some tips to start. If you're already doing it, some benchmarks for you to work towards to help with any other kind of training that you're doing, because it will do. Um, even if you're a big strength guy, right, uh, like I was a few years ago, um, when I got in strongman, cardiovascular endurance training helped me, and I'll back it up with photographic proof. All right, so there you go. Right, so let's get on with part one then. Right. <clears throat> The history of cardiovascular endurance training. Where does it where does it all start? Well, pretty much when man first came down from the trees. There you go. I. Right. It started then because the human body is built to walk and run forty miles a day, hunt down game, kill it and eat it. That's what we're designed to do. All right. We've moved on from there. All right. Cardiovascular training is has, has evolved. Okay, all right, but that's basically what we're built to do. We're built to do that to survive, okay? Right, now, jumping on a few millennia, right? Cardiovascular training in, in sports and things like that, you know, it, it's, it's widely documented throughout history around the world. You can go pretty much anywhere where, even if they didn't have a writing system, they had a pictorial system, um, you will see images of, of, of people running, doing races or whatever, uh, some sort of cardiovascular event, okay? Be it a game, a sport, you know, or actual running, okay? Uh, it's the ancient Sumerian um, stone carvings. Um, <coughs> the Greeks uh, in the original Olympiads uh, back in 608, uh, 688 BC, they had running races as part of the Olympics, but they were, you know, mostly sort of sprints. The longest one that they sort of did, I think, was over um, a mile, maybe two miles, okay? But we're talking, we're going to be talking about longer distance training than that. We're going to be sort of talking six miles or more, okay? Six miles being the minimum distance. Um, we're going to be talking about, you know, six to ten mile um, running. Uh, it's not just about running, okay? I if you can't run like me because you've got an injury, I've got two Achilles tendon injuries that have ended my running days. Um, so for cardio endurance now, I do cycling and indoor rowing. Um, I can still do boxing, but I can't skip. Um, so, you know, we're gonna give you some tips on how to, you know, do things in a slightly different way if running's not your bag or you just can't run. Right, so getting back to the history of it. So, right, so we've got to the Greek Olympiad in 688 BC. And like I said, we're, we're not really dealing with that because we're dealing with cardiovascular endurance training, which goes beyond even the longest race that they did, um, which was about two miles. I might be a bit more, might be a little bit less. I think it was probably less. Um, but really, the, the first inst instance that we can historically prove of a man running uh, what would now be called an ultra marathon or an ultra ultra marathon uh, was back in 490 BC. It was a guy called Philippides. Okay, in 490 BC, uh, the the Greek, Greek the Greeks well Greece uh, was invaded by the Persians. Okay, we're not going to get into the history of the battle because that's not really what we're talking about. Okay. Um, it was mainly the Athenians that were, were, were the main part of the army. Uh, but there were other Greek allies. The Spartans were there. Um, other Greek allies were there. 
And we all know the story, okay, of there was a Greek guy that run from the marathon, the Battle of Marathon. That's why the modern day race of 26.2 miles is called the marathon. I and all the way to Greece and then you know shouts victory and so on and so on. I right, but that's not the full story and it, it misses out really the physical achievement that this guy did and it's phenomenal. Even athletes today, I right, even ultra marathon athletes today would be hard pressed to do what this guy did. Okay? I right, uh uh before the before the Battle of, of Marathon, the, the Athenians realised there weren't enough of them. They were vastly outnumbered. And although they were better equipped, um, they were vastly outnumbered. So they said to uh, Philippides, he wasn't uh, an, um, uh, an, ath an athletic sports runner. Uh, he was a courier, okay? It was a bit of a sacred job. And... Um, he wasn't the only one, but he's really the only one we know about because he's so famous. And one of the generals said, right, uh, Philippides, come here, sunshine. So he's come up. He goes, yes, boss, what's the matter? He goes, right, I need you to run to Sparta and get some more Spartan soldiers because they are the toughest men on the planet. We ain't got enough blokes here. We need more. We need more reinforcements. He goes, no problem, boss. I'll, I'll get it done. Now, <clears throat> Sparta was about 130 miles away, right? maybe a little bit more, right? and he ran all the way there, right? told the Spartans that the, the Greeks needed their help, right? and the Spartans did dispatch troops, right? and the Greeks won. And he ran back to Marathon, right, to deliver that the, 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 the Spartans were on their way. And, and they got there in record time as well. And then, and then the battle was fought. And then after the battle, so he's already run about 260 miles, this guy. And uh, the battle was fought. And then after the battle, um, I think the gentleman in charge was uh, Miltiades. Um Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's right. He's like, well, Philippides, come here. Yes, boss. He said, look, I know I've got you running all over the place so far, but I need someone that I can trust to get back to Athens to tell them that we've won. Okay, right. I'll do that, he says. So anyway, off he runs, right. 25 miles right, across the Greek mountainous countryside. And it's hot. We, you know, we, we, if you've been there, I, I'm sure most of us have been to Greece at least once in our lives. It's redders. It's cracking the flags there. Okay. And he weren't doing it in 140 pound Asics, Nike, or or Adidas trainers. He was doing it in sandals, right, across all terrain. Anyway, and he runs there at. And he ended up running about 300 miles. And what makes it even more spectacular is he did it in three days. 300 miles in three days. That's 100 miles a day. That is incredible, even by today's standards of modern athletes. All right. you, you get one of the Kenyans that run the London Marathon under two hours. You challenge him to do that. I think even they would be pushed to rival that. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> And then he gets to the, the, the steps of the Acropolis in Athens, uh, shouts, Nike, Nike, you know, uh, and then collapses of exhaustion. Uh, but he's delivered his message and he goes down in history. Uh, and then the, 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 the modern day 26.2 mile race, the marathon, is named after, in his honour and the battle, the marathon. Uh, and that's where we get that from. Right, and we've got a picture of him here. Right, so there's a picture of Philippides, right? Probably history's most famous long distance runner. Right, now moving on several millennia through the history of cardiovascular endurance training and racing. And, right, so we're going to move on now to the sort of 1700s. Okay, I. Right. 
and endurance racing really started there in England, right? It started in other places as well, but you know, we're, we're, we're talking about England now, right? Uh, with you know, very rich people, right? You know, betting, right, that their footmen would be faster than their other rich mates' footmen, right? So they'd have a wager, right? They'd train their guy up. And it was normally usually called carriage running because sometimes they'd run along by the side of the carriage while the two rich guys sat inside and, you know, uh, smoked and, 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 and had a glass of um, <clears throat> wine or, or port or whatever. Um, or sometimes it would just be a straight race between the two footmen over a given space, a given, a, 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 a given distance. Uh, also as well what they did is uh, they also started um, man versus horse as well okay I, um, that still goes on today actually um, and, and actually over longer distance um, the man usually beats the horse you wouldn't think so would you but it's because we are a bipedal uh, animal uh, we're more efficient okay at longer distance all right <clears throat> So yeah, that still goes on today. Um, so then, staying around about the sort of seventeen twenties, I well actually, I tell you what, actually going back probably about a thousand, about nine hundred years before around the seventeen hundreds, I uh, another cardiovascular uh, exercise, um, a famous person from history that indulged actually in the pursuit of exercise purely for its physical benefits I at this time it was swimming I and the guy Charlemagne the Great I uh, known as King of the Franks but actually really was king of I uh, an area of, of what is now modern-day France part of Spain and most of Germany I right? he was crowned Holy Roman Emperor um, in 800 um, you know, and but uh, the Holy Roman Empire, as I'm probably sure you were aware, was neither holy uh, nor is it very German, uh, nor was it very Roman. Um, but anyway, right, he, he enjoyed swimming, although you know, baths, you know, because it was post Roman, there was still a lot of bath houses there, um, and he used it for gatherings and uh, political meetings and so on. But he is the first documented person to actually have took part in swimming on his own in the bars, lap after lap after lap after lap, purely for the enjoyment of the physical exercise of it. So there you go, right? There's another man from history that's pioneering sport. Did you know that? If not, you've learned something. We learn something every day, all right? Right, so let's move on about 900 years. Back to, so we've, we've, we've covered, you know, Rich guys betting that their that their footman was was faster than their mates. Staying in around about sort of late seven, the, the, the the early to mid seventeen hundreds, I prize fighting. Okay, first first documented prize fight in in England. Uh, I think it was in sixteen eighty four, and it was popular right through up until the early Victorian era. Uh, enjoyed its heyday in the 18th century and Georgian and Regency period, um, but sort of came into disrepute in the uh, Victorian era. Um, but why, we'll discuss that in another lecture. Now, how did they train, right? They used cardiovascular endurance training as well, okay? I, and it was termed as pedestrianism. Okay, uh, walking basically. Right, the Victorians called it the same. Okay, they were big into it. There, there was manuals in the seventeen hundreds, um, uh, and you know, late, but they were sort of more late seventeen hundreds, early eighteen hundreds. Um, you know, describing how to run, how to swim, you know, and, and things like that. But they came a little bit later. Um, So back to prize fighters. So what they would do is, right, and some very famous uh, ex-prize fighters that became champions, um, 
took their guys out into the countryside of England, right, and they prescribed them lots and lots and lots and lots of very fast walking over uh, uphill, down, dale, cross rivers. Yeah, and they would do 20, 30, up to 40 miles every day, okay? I right, and they would they had a fight camp just like modern boxers do. Um, not quite the same, okay? Um, but that would be the predominance of their training. Um, and then they would go and do their sparring and, and some other bits, okay, and some, and, and some exercise, but that would pretty much be most of it. Um, you know, their diet would be looked at as well, okay, uh, but their diet, dietary requirements weren't as strict as they were a day, um, although it was restrictive because um, if you look at, um, <clears throat> I think it's Jack London when he talks about it, um, yeah, he was restricted to only being allowed to have about five to eight pints of beer a day, um, and him and him moaning about it. Well, <laughs> that's a bit different from nowadays, isn't it? Right, okay, if you're restricted to five to five to eight pints of ale a day, and and you're moaning about it in a fight camp, then you know things have changed. Okay, all right. So uh, uh, the reason why they did it is because it they they believe that it. it strengthened up the legs right and it's same as boxers today boxers today will still road run okay every morning okay um it, and it'll do it before any of their gym work it's, it gets done early morning or sometimes late at night um and they'll run very long distances uh, you know anything up to about 10 miles okay sometimes a little bit more and um, it's to build up strength in their legs and stamina to help get them through the rounds, okay? And that's why the early prize fights did it, because there was there was no set rounds, I you know, it could go on quite a long time, you know, and you know, if you look around the sort of late eighteen hundreds and early nineteen hundreds, you know, uh, if you look at Jack Johnson, the, the first black heavyweight champion in the world, um, you know, one of his fights was 40 rounds. I think his first fight, uh, when he was eventually allowed to fight a white man uh, against Jim Jeffries, was 25 rounds, <laughs> okay? All right. uh, so, you know, you, you, your legs have got to carry you a long time, okay? All right. So that's why they did it. Um, and we've got some pictures of, you know, some Georgian and Regency era uh, price fighters here. Right, so that's the early Western traditional history of cardiovascular endurance training, right? and we've gone up through the 1700s and we've gone into the Georgian and Regency era. And now we're going to get on to the Victorians, all right? They were great believers in exercise, as we all know, all right? Um, the, the first gymnasiums opened in, in England in around about the 1840s. The first German gymnasium um, opened in London somewhere near King's Cross. It's now a restaurant and around about 1860. Um, and they did a, a variety of things, you know, gymnastics, fencing, uh, boxing, you know, it became a gentlemanly art away from prize fighting because that was more frowned upon. Um, and that's why it sort of died a death, you know. Um, they did dumbbell training, uh, rope climbing, ladder climbing, pole climbing, all, all sorts of other stuff like that. And uh, women did it as well, okay. I, um, and also, they were big into cardiovascular exercise, endurance training, okay? Uh, some of them did running, right? But also they were big fans of pedestrianism, okay? Like I said in Professor Charles Harrison's manual of uh, Indian clubs, dumbbell and sword exercise of 1868, he talks about, you know, going out for a five mile walk in an hour, in under an hour actually, before doing your dumbbell routine. And that, that's actually quite a feat, actually, right? You know, the average person walks at uh, 20 minutes a mile, which is three minutes a mile, and um, they're doing it cross country, right? You know, not in running shoes, um, and um, they're doing it in 12 minute miles. Now, that's they ain't slouching, okay? I right? that that's 
that's a that's a good pace. Right. So, what other things did the Victorians do for um, cardiovascular endurance training? Right. Well, well, rowing was already big in this country. Right. Actually, rowing out on the water, rowing clubs because you had the university teams and things like that. Right. But it was the Victorians bringing the gyms in, especially in the, the German type of gymnasiums. They built indoor rowing machines. Right. Not like the, the concept twos we have today, massive, great, big, clunky things, right? With huge, great, big oak, massive oars. And I, and I mean, full length oars. These things were huge, okay? I, here's a picture of one. Right, so there is a picture of a Victorian era indoor rowing machine, right? There was a, a woman doing it, right? women exercised as well it wasn't just a men's thing okay i right? it was for men women you know and as you saw in the picture i right, if you noticed i right, and if you if you rewind it look again you'll see a, a load of massive indian clubs behind her right because that was another big thing you know uh, brought over by charles harrison from india that was introduced into the uk and very popular and also pioneered um, by um, Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband. There you go. Uh, there you go. Another fun fact for fitness. Right. They also didn't just build single-person rowing machines. Okay. They also built ones, uh, you know, for for two people to go on. Again, with massive, great big oak, oak, oak oars. Okay. All right. So you, I would imagine, practice. You know, coxes, pairs, rowing. Uh, I don't have a picture of that. But the thing that's coming up next that I do have a picture of, and this is fantastic actually, all right, it, it was built in Scotland all right, by a guy that was born in 1805. I can't remember his first name, uh, something Cox. All right, and he was, born, like I said, he was born in 1805, and he built and it opened in 1865. It was the world's first open air gymnasium, and it was dedicated to rowing. Right, it was built on a man-made lake. Right, and this thing was a giant circular platform, and it could hold six hundred people rowing at once. Right, and they'd all face the same way, so they'd all be rowing in the same way. Right, and basically, and it it's, and it just go around in a circle. Right, um, and Here's the photo of it now. I mean, that's fantastic, isn't it? I mean, to have something like that built in 1865. Uh, the sad thing was, I, uh, he died in, uh, I think about nine years later. He, did, he died in the 1870s. I think it was 1874. Right? So, uh, he, 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 you know, I mean, he was 69 years old, so, you know, um, wasn't terrifically old for that time, but you know, he didn't have a bad life. Um, so he didn't really get to see, you know, much of its use after it was built. And unfortunately, and it was built in Edinburgh, okay, uh, and um, it was, yeah, it was the, what was it called? It was called uh, the Royal Patent Edinburgh Gymnasium, I think, if I remember rightly. Uh, and uh, it doesn't stand there anymore. Um, they are doing some excavations to try and sort of rebuild it or, or, or make some sort of commemoration of it. And it was levelled out, and you know the man-made lake was pulled out, and they they made a football pitch over the top of it. Um, more's the pity, really. Um, fan fantastic piece of you know Victorian engineering, you know, on that scale, just for fitness. Okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> right. Okay. So. Another thing that the Victorians were into for um, cardiovascular endurance training, okay, wasn't just about going to the gym, chucking dumbbells around, you know, boxing, sparring, fencing, you know, climbing ropes, ladders, stuff like that, indoor and outdoor rowing. Cycling took off right, in the Victorian era, okay, and it was particularly popular with women, okay. I, and the reason it was particularly popular with women is because it they could go out I, and be without a chaperone. 
okay because they weren't meeting but there wasn't the thing well they're going to meet up with a bloke and you know this is going to happen that's going to happen and then you know oh dear she'll come back with a bun in the oven and oh dearie me all right you know so they could get involved in an outdoor activity okay all right but not only did they cycle outdoors okay the victorians even built right with things like the penny farthing okay all right as and, and, and pieces of you know bicycles like that i know they weren't the first bikes to come out uh the first ones coming out around around somewhere around 17 late 1700s was i think it was called the the hobby horse or the horse didn't even have any pedals it had two wooden wheels without tires but the great thing that really what the leap in the victorian era with the galvanization of rubber in the 1830s and um, was the invention of the rubber tire then the pneumatic tire okay which made it a much more enjoyable experience cycling outdoors okay um as you'll see in this picture, okay, there's an in, there's a guy, all right, on a four wheel penny farthing type bicycle on what we would call today a turbo trainer or road rollers. It's mental, right? Yeah, I mean, you can't. I mean, you can't not laugh at that, right? It's a massive, great big bike, four wheels, right? And you know, it, it's, it's brilliant, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, the, the Victorians were great, you know. Um, yeah, you know, they weren't just about building the biggest ships, the building the biggest bridges, and yeah, you know, and, and yeah, you know, doing things like that. They were doing doing stuff like this as well, right? and it was truly fantastic. Uh, and hats off to them. Um, right, well, that sort of rounds up the, the, the history of cardiovascular endurance training, a brief history, right, um, and of what I wanted to talk about. Uh, so what we're going to move on now is we'll, uh, we'll quickly have a quick chat about what we're going to talk about in the, our next chat about it, uh, where we'll talk about why we're having the chat, right, and because no one else is going to have this talk to you is because the fitness industry doesn't want to talk about cardiovascular endurance training, right? Unless they're talking to marathon runners, okay? All right? The general fitness population, they don't want them having anything to do with it, okay? All right? Uh, and we'll discuss why, okay? Uh, and if you're new to um, cardiovascular endurance training, I, I run in, um, you know, well, I'll, I'll give you some tips on how I get my clients into it, you know, um, nice and gently. I, um, if running's not your thing and like me, you've got an injury, then, you know, we'll give you some options to diff different styles of cardiovascular endurance training, like you see in the Victorians do. Um, and we'll look at things that are in the gym, if you, if you, if you go to a gym, and what are the best sorts of types of machines to use and the best ways to use them and what sort of uh, you know uh, effort level that you should be at we'll go through that the pros and cons of the machinery um so you get the idea and what benefits you'll get out of it okay i uh, and we'll prove it okay by if you if you're if you're saying well i'm a big strength guy you know cardio is no good to me oh yes it is and i'll prove it all right because i'll put pictures on there of me doing uh, a strongman truck pull competition, I right, and I'll talk about how cardiovascular endurance training helped me annihilate people there. Okay, but we'll talk about that in the next one. Okay, right. So I'm Dan, the old school conditioning man. This is old school conditioning training, where we make you faster, fitter, tougher, stronger. Okay. Right, well, I hope you've enjoyed this and I hope you look forward to the, the, the next chat. Uh, and I hope you've learned something and I hope you found it interesting, okay, and a little humorous, okay. Um, so, yeah, I look forward to the next one and I'll see you in the next chat. And don't forget, guys, if you've enjoyed what you've seen here, all right, uh, there's a new thing that's come out now that you, you can give me stars, all right, that's really nice. All right, um, please, you know, if you've enjoyed it, you know, Give me some stars. Everyone likes some stars, don't they? Hey? All right. Even a big roughy tufty like me. <laughs> All right. And remember, 
Don't be no crazy fool. You hit that like button and follow down at old school.